Hello friends, I'm Keith Kampschaefer with UncontrolledOpposition.com with a very important message to all those who believe in the name Jesus Christ, our Lord, and for those who are being called by Him. My message is about a great deception that has taken place within the Protestant Church, with this deception leaving few actual, dyed-in-the-wool, Protestant Christian believers around as compared to the 17th and 18th centuries. Now before we can understand why this is, we need to have an understanding of what a true Protestant Christian is. We might presume that with all of the different non-Catholic churches that dot the corners and straights of city streets and country roads across America and around the world, that there are tens of millions of Protestants still existing. But are these non-Roman Catholic practitioners truly Protestant, or are they more appropriately titled Evangelical? What does the title Protestant really mean? And do the various non-Catholic denominations demonstrate the characteristics of Protestantism? To understand what Protestantism is in its truest form, we need to travel back in time and understand how and why the title or term Protestant came into existence. According to Online Etymology Dictionary, the noun Protestant is from 1539 Latin protestantum, present participle of protestari, which means to declare publicly, testify, or protest. Originally used of the German princes and free cities who declared their descent in a letter of protest to the decisions of the Diet of Speyer, 1529, which reversed the liberal terms allowed Lutherans in 1526. The second Diet of Speyer of 1529 reversed the original 1526 decision that princes or leadership could by their own conscience choose to worship the God of their own understanding and conviction. Of course, this is exactly what the Reformers were doing, now having access to mass-produced Bibles as a result of Gutenberg's movable type printing press. But the true God revealed to us by Scripture is certainly not the God the papacy of the Roman Catholic Church would have us understand, as this reveals the true anti-God nature of the papacy, who is the Antichrist. A Roman council consisting of more than 20 political and religious leaders and Reformers of free cities Objecting to the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V's reversal of the liberal 1526 decision, drew up the letter of protestation which was delivered by an embassy to the Emperor that same year of 1529. It is from this point onward that adherents to the Reform Movement or Reformation have been known as Protestants, thus the term Protestant Reformation. The Protestant Reformation is the most pivotal historical movement perhaps since Pentecost and resulted in breaking the oppressive and brutal tyrannical yoke of the Papal Roman Empire from the necks of humanity enslaved since the beginning of the Dark Ages. The beginning and complete span of this oppressive and inhumane period of human history is precisely defined in Scripture and will be demonstrated and outlined within this message. It is this understanding that we need to have about what a true Protestant is. A true Protestant actively objects and openly protests to the actions and maneuvers of the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church. But the modern, evangelical, conventional Christian Church no longer protests the actions of Rome, let alone its existence on earth as the Antichrist, but rather accommodates and even assimilates into her identity. This also is precisely prophesied in Scripture. In conclusion, let us refer to the rallying cry of the great 18th century Irish preacher Henry Groton Guinness, who in his lectures in the British Isles addressing the weakening of Protestantism said these words. The Reformation of the 16th century, which gave birth to Protestantism, was based on Scripture. It gave back to the world the Bible. It taught the Scriptures. It exposed the errors and corruptions of Rome by the use of the sword of the Spirit. It applied the prophecies and accepted their practical guidance. Such reformation work requires to be done afresh. We have suffered prophetic anti-papal truth to be too much forgotten. As Protestants, as Christians, as free men, as philanthropists, as those who are acquainted with the teachings of history, we deplore the existing state of things. We regard all of these changes as a retrograde movement of the most dangerous character and we feel constrained to renew the grand old protest to which the world owes its modern acquisitions of liberty, knowledge, peace, and prosperity. We recognize it as a patent and undeniable fact that the future of our race lies not with Papists, but with Protestants. Its leading nations this day are not Papal Italy, Spain, and Portugal, but Protestant Germany, England, and America. What has made the difference? The nations that embraced the Reformation movement of the 16th century 
have never since ceased to advance in political power, social prosperity, philanthropic enterprise, and general enlightenment, while the nations that refused it and held fast to the corruptions of Rome has as steadily retrograded in all these respects. By their fruits ye shall know them. H. Grattan Guinness, from the book Romanism and the Reformation, from the standpoint of prophecy. So as we now understand that Protestantism is adverse to papistry and should be a force against it, logic would demand a resistance to Catholicism as well. What are we doing now to stand up as true Protestants to resist the advances of the Vatican's drive for a universal church as head of a global government? Are we protesting and resisting these advances and occupying and defending the territory of truth? Or have we let the Vatican run roughshod over our political, social, educational, economic, and military ideals and institutions? The truth is we have given up the hallowed pastures of truth and are now confined to the deluded territory of stockyards. The papal agents of the Vatican have sent out their cowboy cardinals, known as the Jesuits, to round up the renegades from Rome and line them up for the branding at the Triple Six Corral. Did we forget something? Did we forget that the fatal wound was not really fatal, that it only appeared to be fatal? And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. We must realize the connection of the Protestant Reformation to the apparent deadly wound of the beast. The Reformation was a near fatal blow which nearly destroyed the papacy and their quote unquote unholy Roman Empire. And in reaction, the Vatican covertly declared war on the Protestant Reformation at the Council of Trent. This was a counterattack against the Reformation that is appropriately and obviously called the Counter-Reformation. The Roman Catholic Church set forth an initiative to reinterpret the scriptures that were pointing to the papacy as the Antichrist. In addition to this, a goal was to infiltrate the Protestant movement and sabotage the churches with division, scandal, false doctrine, and to even preach from their pulpits, just for starters. This is where the devices of several Jesuits come into play and what they did with their newfound interest in the scriptures that for centuries they had kept concealed from the common man. In desperation to remove the finger pointing at Papal Rome as the Antichrist, a Spanish Jesuit from Salamanca named Francisco Ribera, 1537-1591, devised a corrupted interpretation of the prophetic scriptures about the coming Messiah revealed in Daniel 9, 24-9, as commonly referred to as the 70 weeks of Daniel prophecy. In a 500-page commentary on the Apocalypse published around 1580, Ribera took Daniel 9.27 and the confirmation of the covenant by Christ's death on the cross as the final sacrifice of atonement, which brought about the end of oblations in the midst of the symbolic week, and said that it was not about Christ, but about a one-man antichrist that will appear during a seven-year end-time great tribulation. Carrying on the agenda of the now deceased Ribera in his attempt to hide the papal antichrist was an Italian cardinal, Robert Bellarmine, 1542-1621, the most notorious of all Jesuit controversialists. Where Ribera had started in corrupting the year-date symbology in the book of Daniel and the blasphemous reversal with Christ being the antichrist in Daniel 9.27, perverting the day-year interpretation completely, and claimed that Daniel, John, and Paul's writings have no connection whatsoever to the papacy. In his book, Polemic Lectures Concerning the Disputed Points of the Christian Belief Against the Heretics of This Time, Bellarmine continues to promote the Ribera lie of a one-man antichrist that will appear during a seven-year end-time Great Tribulation. As most of you probably realize, this interpretation known as futurism of an end-time seven-year tribulation where a single man antichrist rules the world is the predominant teaching in today's fallen Protestant churches. And following the futurism, or as it's now called, dispensationalism started by Ribera, there is also preterism started by another Jesuit trying to hide the antichrist, this time not hiding him in the distant future, but in the distant past. Just for the record, 
These facts are not disputed even among Catholic scholars and theologians. The Roman Catholic writer G. S. Hitchcock is recorded as saying, quote, The Futurist School, founded by the Jesuit Ribera in 1591, looks for the Antichrist, Babylon, and a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem at the end of the Christian dispensation. He goes on to say, quote, The Preterist School, founded by the Jesuit Alcazar in 1614, explains the revelation by the fall of Jerusalem or by the fall of pagan Rome in 14. 10 AD. Again, that is, the Roman Catholic writer G. S. Hitchcock from the book The Beast and the Little Horn, page 7. So to try to convince the world that the papacy is not the Antichrist, Louis de Alcazar, 1554-1613, devised the Preterist movement and said that the Antichrist and the abomination of desolation had already come and gone in the distant past as Nero and the destruction of Jerusalem or the fall of pagan Rome three and a half centuries later. And with the supposed death of Nero as the Antichrist, all prophecies have been fulfilled and we are now living in the millennial, 1,000 year reign of Christ, if you can stomach that. This is all an apostasy. If you read Daniel 9, 24 through 27 carefully, you will see that the oblation, the sacrificial system of the Jews was done away with because Christ was the final sacrifice. And to put an exclamation point on it, the temple curtain, one to make Berber envious, was torn in two from top to bottom. Jesus has left the house. He does not live in temples made with human hands. He lives in our hearts. But the modern church teaches that the Antichrist will arrive in a new, rebuilt temple and start up the sacrifices again, only to halfway through betray the Jews and do away with the sacrifice. This is all part of the great deception that has come upon the world. To begin to name the major players involved in this from the Protestant or non-Catholic churches would be a drag on one's patience and possibly missing the mark of spiritual profitability. If any finger pointing is to be called for, which it is, it needs to be pointed back to where it was pointed before and during the Protestant Reformation. It needs to be pointed at the Antichrist who is the papacy, the little horn of Daniel, the lawless one of Paul, and the harlot of Revelation spoken of by John. It is the Antichrist who has deceived the whole world, and the agents of the Antichrist are the Jesuits, the ones responsible for the blasphemous interpretation of Daniel's 70th week. And this heretic interpretation is not only responsible for hiding the true Antichrist, but also for hiding the true Church, who is the Israel of God. But that is a lesson for another time. But if these apostasies weren't enough to deceive the unstudied Christian and casual believer, the exotic myth of a secret catching away rose up from the lab table in or around 1830. According to reports, a young Scottish girl named Margaret MacDonald apparently had a vision or dream about the Lord secretly removing the saved souls from off the earth. This event just so happened to be in a church that Edward Irving, a popular and prominent Scottish pastor, was affiliated with. After Irving unhooked the cords and conduits from this spiritual Frankenstein called the pre-tribulation rapture, the monster took on a life of its own. I can only conjecture as to who is behind this monstrosity lurking in the shadows all along. Was it Bellarmine's invention or some other Jesuit warrior who never received recognition for the greatest concoction of spiritual poison ever invented, but perhaps went on to become Pope as his reward? And what better way to get this into the Protestant church than to coax some young Scottish lass into sharing a fabricated dream or vision with a prominent, though carefully profiled, and ambitious pastor with a large following and esteemed name? And furthermore, how many current evangelical wolves in sheep's clothing are living the dream life for 30 pieces of silver taken from the Vatican? If the Jesuits can't win with open opposition, they'll win with covert infiltration. And what quicker way to infiltrate the Protestant Reformation than to, quote unquote, buy off the men behind the pulpit. But in order to get back to the truth, we have to turn to Scripture. We have to return to the Word of God. And with this rather extensive introduction, a point of reference as to where we are, after we unroll these scrolls and these ancient maps we have called the pages of Scripture, hopefully we'll get out of this fiendish forest of futurism and get back on the straight and narrow of the true interpretation of Scripture.